Welcome back. So, let us continue from where we left off. Uh, before we do that, quick recap as usual. Uh, the various approaches to equity valuation which are commonly used either individually or in combination are the DCF models, the income based models, the asset based models and relative valuation. Of course, we also have the option based model, but that we will talk about later on uh, when we go to the derivative segment of this course. So, as far as the DCF models are concerned, uh, there are four variants of this model. We have the enterprise DCF, where we discount the free cash flows to the firm on the basis of the weighted average cost of capital, post tax weighted average cost of capital. The post tax effect captures the impact of the interest tax yield. And then we have the equity cash flow model, where we discount the free cash flows to equity. Uh, that is the cash flows that are uh, left over for the residual cash flows that are left over for distribution to the equity shareholders and we discount them at the levered cost of equity that is the risk adjusted cost of equity. And then uh, we had the adjusted present value method where we separated out the impact of debt or the uh, value addition due to debt. We value the firm as an unlevered firm, uh, we calculate the free cash flows accordingly and we discount them at the unlevered cost of equity. And then we use a discretionary rate to discount the interest tax yields and uh, add that valuation to the value of the unlevered firm to arrive at the value of the levered firm. Uh, then we finally have the capital cash flow model, which is in some sense a variant of the adjusted present value method, where we account for the interest tax yields explicitly in the numerator while calculating the free cash flows. And then we discount these cash flows, uh, that is the free cash flows to the firm plus the interest tax yields at the pre-tax uh, weighted average cost of capital. So, the impact of taxation is captured in the numerator in this case. Whereas, in the case of enterprise DCF, the impact of taxation is captured in the denominator. So, that makes the valuation consistent. Then we moved over to the income based approaches. We have in line with the free cash flows to the firm approach or the enterprise DCF approach and the free cash flows to the equity or the equity approach. We have the economic profit approach, which is parallel to what we have in the case of the free cash flows to the firm and we have the residual income approach which is parallel to the equity based valuation, the direct equity valuation. Uh, as uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the economic profit as well as the free cash flow, the enterprise DCF model gives us the value of equity indirectly by deducting the value of debt from the value of the firm. Whereas, the residual value method or the equity cash flow approach gives us the value of equity directly. The formula for the two uh, income based approaches that I elucidated just now is given on this slide. Uh, we uh, start with the initial uh, t equal to 0, uh, that is the point at which you are doing the valuation, we are initiating the valuation. Uh, invested capital, that is the sum of the fixed asset, net fixed assets and current asset, net current assets on the at the point at which the valuation commences, valuation period commences. And then we add to it the, the uh, present value or the discounted value of profit, which is in a sense the surplus profit, we will come back to it. Uh, uh, the present value or the discounted profit of economic profit, uh, the discount rate used being the post tax cost of, uh, post tax cost of capital. And then we have the uh, equity valuation model or the residual income valuation model, where we start with the book value of equity and add to it the present value of all future residual income discounted at the levered cost of equity. Now, economic prof these are the definitions. Economic profit is defined as no plat minus capital charge, where no plat is EBIT minus taxes on EBIT. EBIT is profit before tax plus interest minus non operating income. So, when we talk about EBIT, as I emphasized earlier also, you are talking about the income from the regular operations of the business. Taxes on EBIT, we have pro, uh, provision for taxation plus interest tax shield minus taxes on non operating income. So, because we are excluding non operating income, we need to exclude the impact of taxation on non operating income here as well. So, again we need to look back at the issue 
issue of consistency and compatibility. No plat may also be defined as the return on invested capital into the opening balance of invested capital. Capital charge is defined as WACC post tax into invested capital opening balance. Invested capital I mentioned earlier is the net operating assets that is net fixed assets plus net working capital. Residual income is defined as the surplus income available to equity shareholders that is net income minus equity charge. Uh, please note uh, this net income is before dividend. So, uh, dividend is uh, proxied by the equity charge. So, it is net income uh, minus equity charge. Net income is the return on equity into the opening balance book value of equity and equity charge is equal to the cost of equity which, which is the required return uh, for equity shareholders. Uh, and please note this is uh, in substitution of the dividend. So, cost of equity into equity capital the opening balance of equity capital the book balance of the equity capital. So, this is what is residual income. Then we moved over to asset based valuation. In asset based valuation we value a business by valuing its individual assets. These individual assets can be both tangible as well as intangible. Uh, asset based valuation is ap appropriate when we are looking at a liquidation valuation of the firm or we are working out trying to work out the accounting value of the firm in line with the requirements of the accounting standards which have made a paradigm shift to the fair value framework, fair value accounting uh, in substitution of uh, to some extent or a significant extent of historical cost accounting. Then uh, this uh, asset based valuation is also useful when we talk about valuation of some of the parts. If a business is made up of individual divisions, you can value each of these divisions separately and then aggregate all these valuations to arrive at the value of the business. We, the asset based valuation can again be done on the basis of intrinsic valuation asset wise for each asset you work out the intrinsic value of that asset or you work out the relative value of that particular asset or you go on the basis of book value of that asset. So, these are three options that are available when we are looking at the asset based valuation of a uh, business. Uh, now, relative valuation where well, relative valuation is uh, uh, in a sense uh, you compare the value of similar assets in the market and then we you, you use that as a benchmark for valuing the business or the asset that you are talking about. So, in relative valuation the value of an asset is compared to the values assessed by the market for similar or comparable assets. However, you need to follow a, a proper methodology for doing relative valuation as well. Otherwise, uh, it, there is liable to be distortion in the valuation. So, first of all you need to have a collection of comparable companies, comparable assets and then obtain market values of those assets, market value of the, so for example, if you are valuing shares, you need to have the market prices of those uh, shares of the com comparable companies that you have already identified under step 1. Then you need to compare these uh, market valuations of these uh, shares or uh, other assets as the case may be uh, into standardized values. Uh, because uh, each company is going to have singularities therefore, it is not possible not practicable or not correct really to uh, arrive or to use uh, the prices straight away. You need to for example, if you are comparing uh, the, uh, the prices of houses or you want to value a particular house, uh, you cannot straight away compare the prices of various houses in the neighborhood. It is better that you uh, do you arrive at the house cost per unit area and then or uh, then use that multiple of the house cost per unit area for valuing the house that you are uh, targeting. So, that is the essence of the issue. The issue is that you have the market prices of the shares, but you need to have uh, a standardized market price per unit of some some parameter, some attribute of the company for example, the earnings or the book value as the case may be. So, that is uh, called standardization. We standardize the prices with respect to certain realizations, certain recoveries that you would made from uh, investing in these assets uh, for example, the earnings of the company or the book value of the company these are common multiples. Then uh, we need to do take up some kind of a, it is before this before we start taking averages uh, it is more appropriate that we uh, prepare a 
uh, some kind of a statistical distribution of these standardized values to arrive at and identify outliers and properly account for them. Uh, outrightly excluding outliers or uh, putting a cap is likely to dis distort the averages and therefore, it is appropriate that we study those outliers and then take an appropriate decision on how to deal with them. And then the next step would be that you take some kind of an average of the standard multiples over the comparable set after accounting for or adjusting for the outliers. Uh, then you compare the standardized value or multiple of the asset being analyzed to the average standardized value of comparable assets. So, then you compare the standard for example, if you have a price earning ratio of the target company, you can compare it with the or average of the price earning ratio of the set of comparable companies after accounting for or after adjusting for outliers in an appropriate manner. And then the before you finally arrive at a decision, you should also take account of the possibility of there being uh, differences between the firms that you have uh, in your comparable set and the target firm. Uh, you need to look at that very closely. You look at the you need to look at the drivers of value that go into the uh, multiple. For example, the price earning multiple is driven by growth rates, is driven by uh, the, uh, the uh, return on equity and the, and the, the uh, required return by the shareholders. So, these are some of the factors uh, in the risk of the company as well. These are some of the factors which would go into determining the price earnings multiple. So, before you convert, uh, compare the price earnings ratio of your company, the target company with the standardized values, you need to consider differences in these parameters, uh, in these attributes uh, and account for them uh, to arrive at a final decision uh, as to the underpricing or overpricing of the target company. Now, we come to a new topic, uh, um, this is fundamental an analysis. So far, I whatever uh, summarized just now have been the methods, the approaches that are used for the valuation of equity shareholders. We now move on to the determination or the approaches to the determination of the inputs that go into this kind of valuations. So, that is uh, done uh, through a concept which is a collectively termed to be fundamental analysis. So, let us first look at the definition of fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis refers to the extensive analysis conducted by the security analyst of the relevant information in order to arrive at his best estimates of input values that go into determining the intrinsic value of a security as per the analyst's chosen model. Let me repeat, this is a very important definition. Fundamental analysis refers to the extensive analysis conducted by the security analyst of the relevant information, all information that is relevant to the determination of the inputs that go into the model for determining the value of the uh, enterprise or the, uh, or the equity of a company in order to arrive at his best estimates of input values that go into determining the intrinsic value of a security as per the analyst chosen model. You have to con contrast the fundamental analysis with the technical analysis, which is another form of analysis. Now, while the fundamental analysis is largely founded or largely based on the analysis of the financials of the company over a sustained period of time, how the financials of the company have progressed, what are the salient uh, features of the or the trends that are uh, uh, incorporated uh, in the financial statements either explicitly or latently. Uh, technical analysis believes that uh, or is based on the maxim that history repeats itself and it technical analysis bases its analysis on the analysis of uh, the various price patterns of over the history of the firm or the trading uh, of the stock of the firm. In other words, what patterns have been uh, observed in the stock uh, uh, prices over a sustained period of time, technical analysis goes into detail, into depth into analyzing those patterns, those trends that are incorporated in the prices and on that basis it tries to make uh, assessment of future prospects of the firm. Uh, if a particular pattern uh, re-emerges for example, uh, the 
technical analysis cha uh, charter would immediately react and uh, uh, and base his uh, investment decision on the premise that uh, once that pattern has re-emerged, it would be followed by the subsequent pattern that has been emerged earlier. So, uh, if in the earlier case that particular uh, uh, pattern had been followed by a bull, bullish activity, he would react that uh, uh, the future would also be bullish. So, that is the perception of uh, technical analysis, that is the assumption of technical analysis. And let us get into it. Technical analysis is a trading discipline employed to evaluate investments and identify trading opportunities in price trends and patterns seen on charts. So, that is the important thing. You do not go into that, you do not go deep rooted into the financials of the company. What you do is the superficial analysis of the prices of the uh, volumes uh, and other singular features of the trading activity of a particular firm and the, on the basis of a study of those uh, charts of prices, volumes and other features of trading activity, you arrive at certain conclusions about the future behavior of prices. If a particular pattern is being repeated like a candlestick pattern, you would react by taking, by believing that following that candlestick pattern, the prices would react in a particular manner and thereafter you would base your investment decisions on that premise. So, technical an analysts believe past trading activity and price changes of a security can be valuable in indicators of the security's future price movement. This is the fundamental assumption underlying technical analysis. Technical analysts believe past trading activity and price changes of a security can be valuable indicators of the security's future price movements. So, technical analysis may be contrasted with fundamental analysis, just what I mentioned just now. Technical analysis may be contrasted with fundamental analysis, which focuses on a company's financials, the trends in the company's financials, right from the base. Uh, uh, fundamental analysis, analysis uh, analyzes the company through its annual reports. So, it, it, the annual reports over a sustained period of time, a number of years and then tries to identify trends hidden within the accounting information, whereas a, a, a technical analysis uh, is a superficial analysis, entirely superficial analysis that bases its conclusions on a study of the price patterns in the market, uh, volume activity and other trading signals that are, um, that are uh, identified by the analyst on the basis of these patterns. Components of fundamental analysis, its fundamental analysis is usually conducted through a three pronged strategy. The EIC strategy, it is commonly known as EIC strategy and the EIC stand for the economy analysis, the industry analysis and finally, the company analysis. Now, the approaches to fundamental analysis can be either a traditional top down approach where you start with the economy and then zero down on the company's financials or you can start it the other way around. You can start with a bottom up approach where you identify the company first and on that basis uh, you uh, try to relate it to the economy of the uh, of the country mm, or you can also have a combination of both which is the hybrid approach. So, in the top down approach, the top down analysis begins with expectations about a macroeconomic variable. For example, the expected growth rate of nominal gross domestic product GDP. Revenue projections of the company are derived on the basis of some kind of an association that the analyst is able to identify, is able to correlate between the revenue generations of the company that is proposed to be analyzed and the GDP of the uh, country. Uh, so, revenue projections are related to the GDP growth activity, the overall growth of the economy. For example, an expected relationship between GDP growth and a company sales is an example of a uh, top down approach. Bottom up approach uh, as I mentioned starts in the reverse direction. It an, uh, starts with anal analyzing an individual company or its reportable segments and then revenue projections are based on historical revenue growth or a company's new product introductions over the forecast horizon and are con uh, these kind of approaches are 
considered bottom up approach. So, in the top down approach you start with the economy, you start with the growth rate in GDP or some similar parameter and on that basis you try to correlate that in these growth rates with the growth rates of the uh, revenues of the firm uh, in uh, by identifying some kind of an underlying relationship some kind of a latent relationship between the two variables, the nation's GDP and the company's sales. In the bottom up approach, it is the other way around. You I try to work out estimates of revenue based on the historical performance of the company itself and if the company is launching a new product, you make estimates on the basis of the uh, technical inputs that you get from the technical departments and so on. Hybrid approach incorporates elements of both the top down and the bottom up approach as its name signifies. By using elements of both methods, a hybrid analysis can highlight any inconsistencies in assumptions between the top down and the bottom up approach. A hybrid analysis is the most common type of analysis that is commonly adopted. Economic analysis, now this is uh, 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 the trends in macroeconomic variables. I shall be very brief on these segments of the course because uh, they are not as I mentioned the mainstream of this particular course. However, we need to know a little bit about these things when we are doing security analysis and that is the reason I have put them in this um, in this presentation. Um, so, trends in macroeconomics variables that need to be studied that could shed uh, insightful information on the valuation of securities, valuation of shares uh, are the trends in gross domestic product, gross national product, employment statistics, aggregate corporate profits, personable, personal I am sorry, personable disposable income, balance of payments position, inflation, government spending, money supply. Then economic polo policies that need to be studied by the security analyst include plan priorities, monetary policies, fiscal policies, industrial policy, regulation and control of prices, wages and production. So, these are some of the important policies that need to be uh, studied by the analyst and some of the macroeconomic variables that whose trends also need to be examined by the analyst. Well, when forecasting or doing a fundamental analysis of the inputs for forecasting the price of a uh, security. Relationship between economic trends and policies also need to be studied by the analyst. And, no, and uh, this analysis, the economic analysis need not be confined to the borders of the country, the domestic borders. You also need to have a feel of how the international economic environment is going to impact the economy of the country, the changes, the important decisions that are taken at the international level, uh, which are likely to impact the imports, exports, exchange rates, interest rates in our country also need to be examined. I mean, then we talk about industry analysis. Industry analysis uh, in what are the important factors uh, issues that need to be considered while doing industry analysis. Let us quickly go through them. Implications of projected growth in gross national product for relevant industries. How do the, uh, uh, the growth rate in GDP or GNP relates to various industries in the spectrum? that is an important uh, that will convey important message about the growth rates that is possible in the revenues of the target company. Implication of plan priorities and plan expenditures for relevant industries, vulnerability of industry under government regulation and control of prices and production, implication of industrial and fiscal policies of the government for an industry input output analysis of an industry sales, degree of dependence on scarce non-renewable or imported raw materials and energy intensity, vulnerability of industry to business cycles, linkage between the sectors vulnerable to business cycle and the industries, life cycle position of the industry, price and income elasticity of the end products of the industry analysis of competitive conditions as reflected in the barriers to entry. 
So, this is an illustrative list, please note it is not an exhaustive list, it is certainly not an exhaustive list, but it is an illustrative list of issues uh, that need to be examined by the analyst when talking about or when doing a industry analysis for valuation purposes. We also need to look at cost structures, competitive advantages of market and market structure, permanence, probability of product obsolescence. A vulnerability to external shocks, foreign competition, regulatory and tax conditions and, and labor conditions. Quantitative aspects of uh, industry uh, analysis, well we need to do end use analysis that will comprise of identifying demand for the industry's products, estimates of future demand, identification of possible substitutes emerging in the market, uh, then ratio analysis can be done uh, that will help us in examining data over time, how is the data uh, showing trends over time, what are the patterns incorporated or embedded in the historical data, we can identify those patterns uh, largely through ratio analysis. So, favorable and unfavorable trends can be looked at and then we can also do regression analysis uh, by determining the relationship between various variables. There are different types of industries, we have the cyclical industry whose performance is positively related to economic activity, we have defensive industry whose performance is insensitive to economic uh, activity and then we have growth industry which is characterized by rapid growth in sales independent of the business cycle. Uh, we can split up the industry life cycle itself into several uh, rel reasonably well defined segments, we have the birth phase which is uh, characterized by heavy research and development costs, heavy research and development expenditure and large it may this phase may, uh, may incur large losses with low revenues. Then we have the growth phase where the company or the industry and goes into the uh, building of the market share and economies of scale and starts using the benefits of economies of scale. We have the mature growth phase which is, which is the phase uh, in which the, the industry realizes the maximum profitability. Then we have stabilization phase in which an increase in unit sales may be achieved by decreasing prices and finally, we have the decline phase where demand shifts lead to declining sales and profitability resulting in possible losses. The industry life cycle and alternative segregation of the segments or the various constituents of the uh, industry life cycle is as follows. A startup stage where many new firms enter into the industry uh, and there is rapid growth. Uh, then we have the consolidation stage where which is the shake out period where the inefficient or the where we have the a maximum of it, uh, survival of the fittest and those that are not able to uh, to manage or face the competitive environment uh, tend to leave out or tend to move out of the industry. So, this is the consolidation stage which is the shake which involves shake out of the various um, in inefficient or incompetent firms uh, and the growth slows down. Uh, and, and then we have the maturity stage which grows with the economy and finally, we have the decline stage where the growth gets lower than the economy. So, this is another characterization of the industry life cycle, uh, either of the two could be used or maybe both could be used for analyzing the industrial environment in which the company is operating. The Porter four, four, 5 forces model, I am sorry, the Porter 5 forces model gives us uh, valuable insights into the nature of the industry and the relationship between the industry and the company. The 5 forces identified in this model are the threat of new entrants into the industry, threat of substitutes, bargaining power of buyers, bargaining power of suppliers and rivalry among existing competitors. These are the 5 forces or 5 characteristics or 5 attributes which contribute or which could help us in analyzing uh, and getting more uh, reliability or reliable information, uh, reliable assessment about the uh, standing of the firm in the industry. The impact of these 5 forces, well briefly let us look at that. If the 
threat of new entrants is low, the um, company would enjoy higher pricing power and better prospects for earning growth. If the probability or the uh, threat of new entrants is higher, then the company would have uh, restricted uh, restrictions or limitations on the pricing power and better prospects. That is very natural because uh, as the possibility or probability of new entrants into the industry increases, the competition or the pressure or the stress on that firm decrease, uh, increases and as a result of it uh, the margins may need to be squeezed. Uh, significant barriers to entry into an industry make it possible for existing companies to maintain high returns on invested capital. Uh, as I mentioned just now, threat of substitute products, companies that have less pricing, companies will have, companies will have less pricing power when the threat of substitute products is high and switching costs are low. So, if, if there are substitute products available in the market or there is a threat of new substitute products entering into the market, naturally the pricing power of the target company would be lower uh, because if the company uh, undertakes or uh, takes up high pricing in, uh, or a revises price upwards, uh, it would provide an incentive for new entrants or for the substitutes to get into the uh, fray and thereby eat into the margins of the uh, target company. Bargaining power of suppliers again, if the bargaining power of suppliers is high, then naturally the company's prospects for earning growth are low and conversely, if the bargaining powers of suppliers is low, then the company's prospects for earning growth are higher. If suppliers are few, these suppliers may be able to extract a large portion of any increase in profits. Uh, similarly, bargaining power of customers, the logic is pretty much the same. If the if the company has, uh, if if there is the, the if the customers, I'm sorry, have high bargaining power, then what happens is that the company will have less pricing power and will have squeezed margins. This is especially true when a small number of customers are responsible for a large proportion of the firm sales and switching costs are low. Intensity of industry rivalry companies that have less pricing power when the intensity of industry rivalry is high. So, uh, if the industry rivalry is high, naturally the uh, there would be higher com competition, higher pressure on the target companies and as a result of which companies, the target company would have lower pricing power. Now, we come to company analysis. So, that I will start after the break. Thank you.